uh, uh, crystal phase, or even spectral phase will be uh, will disappear also. Um, so let's switch to the model, and I talked something. I talked already something about about the, the pneumatic and uh, hexatic phase. For he or hexatic phase, of course, we have this uh, hexatic packing on on of uh, of DNA helices, but in semantic phase, we have two phases. These two are electron density maps constructed for, from uh, uh, X-ray data. And uh, we have two periodicities. Let's uh, call this symmetric A phase and this is symmetric B phase. Uh, in symmetric A phase, we, we have around 60 nanometers periodicity. In symmetric B phase, we have around 35 nanometers periodicity. And uh, if you would like to um, um, figure out Think about about uh, how how we can obtain those two periodicities. It's uh, the, the the simplest way is just take this uh, dimer and put here, and then we can obtain uh, this this periodicity. Of course, we, if we sh if we shift those those uh, dimers in this case, then we can get this small periodicity. If they were uh, packed like like this one, then we can get this 35 periodicity. But we did also um, Monte Carlo simulations, and what we found out that those two structures probably are not possible. Most energetically uh, probable structure is folded model, which is here, and we did not expect this uh, um, Okay, so let's go to conclusion. So the first, for the first time, we have shown that that uh, uh, all. In all uh, uh, DNA systems, um, we have experimentally proved that the, the formation, the, the formation of the symmetric phase, and um, uh, what we have found uh, related to the linking part with, with flexible linking part, which is this is analogic to, to to small mesogenic molecules, as I said previously, that when we increase this flexible part then usually pneumatic phase and symmetric phase will uh, disappear and uh, for a very long uh, flexible part we will, we will get only uh, crystal phase. Um, and in using the, the Monte Carlo simulation we, we, uh, we, uh, um, we um, confirmed that the, the ported model probably is most, most favorable and additionally uh, um, those guys Wu uh, and Tullius in 2003, they performed a gel electrophoretic mobility experiment, which shows on the, a GAP DNA, which is something similar to our system, that those GAP DNA with this flexible linker probably is uh, um, the most available structure is uh, is uh, uh, for that uh, structure. Thank you. When you have a semantic material made out of something chiral and you have twist, sometimes you get a twist gray boundary phase. Is there any any thought that that's here? Like you would have some screwed locations in the system, and the whole axis would twist. Yeah, this is possible. Yeah, this is possible, but in this case, I mean, we didn't see that. No evidence of it. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Cars two. So, what was the the length for the linker? I mean, how uh, small and uh, how long you can go? From 1 to 20 in single strength DNA. 1 to 20? Yes. But you said if it's a smaller, you won't see such a semantic I effect. I see what? If it's small. So one nucleotide then is... Then it can't fold. Yeah, then it can fold, yeah. Yeah, that's why we, we, we observe only pneumatic phase. I mean, probably this is the reason, because Monte Carlo simulations show that, that uh, when uh, for, uh, for uh, 20 tinnina in this flexible part, that most favorable uh, structure is for the model. So then probably when you have too short linker, which means that, that this molecule cannot bend and cannot form the uh, Yeah, so you mentioned, I'm just curious, you made a mention of the, uh, the interest of Microsoft in DNA-based memory. So, would these liquid crystal conformations be good ones for that? Would, would you actually be able to get access to the memory in such a liquid crystal conformation? Uh, I think this can be very useful. I mean, in case when we will get a very well aligned uh, sample. 
because then the sequence can be very easy read with some with some uh, devices here because somehow we have to read the sequence where the, 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 the our information is saved somehow. Okay. Okay. Uh, what could we learn about DNA from these approaches about that DNA. we don't know? What, what property of DNA could be highlighted by um, making a nematic out of it? I mean, so far, we did only experiments with uh, TININA in this flexible linker. And uh, uh, yeah, the question is what we can expect with, when we will have uh, um, different bases in this flexible linker. Right now, we don't know what we can expect. And uh, if we change this thing uh, to, to some other base, also with the same, uh, we fill this, this linker with the same base, uh, but not not similar. Probably you can expect also some other from, uh, properties. So it's a, a lot of questions right now, and we just started. So, okay. Sergey. So can you actually count uh, this your dimer in half and has? some kind of monomer, so we will have... No, that was quick chemistry reaction. Like chemistry reaction? No, no, like, uh, yeah. okay, maybe I'm not saying that oh, you okay. use scissors, but somehow with different ways. So since we have uh, long uh, uh, double yeah. DNA and then uh, short or longer flexible mm -hmm. tail, so you will have com uh, comparison between like this dimer and uh, monomer in some sense. Mm -hmm. So maybe yeah, the, the properties will be similar or different and it will give you some kind of yeah, this, what this is experiment is also yeah. And if there are no more questions, let's thank Miroslav again. <laughs>
the main thing here is that the, uh, the steps of the process is pretty conserved from uh, bacteria to human cells. And the uh, family of proteins is called the uh, REC8 or RAS1 proteins, which are uh, REC8 is a protein in E. coli and RAS1 in higher eukaryotes such as uh, human cells. Uh, so uh, what these proteins do is that when the double strand break happens and then there's a single strand region, they make, uh, they self-assemble these filaments on a single strand DNA and together they we call it nuclear protein filaments. So they search in the genome for the homologous sequence and when, it, when they find this uh, homologous sequence then the uh, strand exchange happens and then uh, it repairs the DNA and then disassembles. Uh, it's a very complicated process, as I uh, mentioned. There are lots of other factors which are involved in this uh, process, but here my research is only focuses on the step five and six phase, which is the search mechanism and uh, repair. Uh, and uh, I'll mention later, I'll just briefly tell you what has been done uh, in the lab of RK, and my project is on uh, graphics. Uh, so, again, the objective of the, uh, this project is to look at the mechanism by which these nuclear protein filaments find the uh, homology and um, uh, do the repair. And uh, it's, it's very fast, I find it very fascinating because the cell does it very rapidly and very accurately. And it's a still, a lot of the studies have been done, but it's a still not known the exact mechanism of this uh, homology search. And, uh, repair. Uh, so our lab uh, uh, looks at this uh, uh, repair mechanism uh, by single molecule, by uh, using single molecule techniques. And uh, here I'm, I, I mentioned two different techniques that uh, I've been using uh, to look at this problem. Uh, so for any uh, uh, DNA protein, doing single molecule studies for DNA protein, to look at DNA protein interaction, you need to immobilize the DNA first and then look at the interaction with different proteins of uh, interest. Uh, so the first method is to, you can uh, uh, attach uh, the DNA to a glass surface by uh, using a uh, biotin and streptavidin interaction, which is a very uh, strong protein-protein interaction. So you, you attach both ends of, uh, ends of DNA, and then you can use the turf microscopy, which only, basically only eliminate whatever is the closest to the uh, surface. And uh, you can label the DNA with fluorescent dyes and visualize them. This, this method gives you, it has advantages and dis disadvantages. The advantage is that it has a higher sensitivity because you have less background. You don't uh, excite the, uh, anything which is uh, uh, above 200 nanometers above the cover glass. But the other thing is that you would get a lot of uh, non-specific uh, interaction of the protein with the surface. The other method that we use is that uh, we use a dual optical traps. Basically, you attach the DNA again with biotin and streptavidin uh, interaction to uh, polystyrene beads, and then you trap the beads with a very focused laser and IR laser, and then uh, one, la one laser is fixed, the other one is movable, uh, so you can basically get the, adjust the end to end distance of the DNA again, and for this technique, uh, you use empty fluorescence, uh, which again, as I mentioned, has a higher background, but it gives you the advantage of uh, controlling the end to end distance of the DNA. And here it shows uh, uh, the same uh, DNA attached to the beads and labeled with uh, fluorescent dark holes. Uh, so, how do we use this, uh, this technique to look at the Recombination. So uh, this is basically, I'm um, going to tell you a, a summary about the work that the previous post I did in the lab on the uh, using both techniques. So uh, we, you basically take a DNA, this is not drawn to the scale, but it's just to uh, explain the idea of the experiment. So you have a, a target double strand DNA, and you make a single strand uh, which is homologous, to a region on that double strand DNA uh, by PCR polymers, uh, uh, by, uh, by basically amplifying it. And we, here we, I should mention that we label the single strand DNA and the protein is not labeled. Uh, 
so you mix the single strand DNA, which is homologous to that region of double strand DNA, and then you mix it with the protein, which is uh, red A here, and it basically preform the filament. And then you mix them together with the target DNA and look at the end product of the bond reaction. Uh, so here it shows the um, mix it. So you mix it and then you attach it to the final product on the glass surface. And as you can, I hope you can see it here. There's a DNA and the red spot which shows the nuclear um, protein filament, uh, which is uh, for this case you're expecting the homologous region in, in the center of the DNA, and as you expect, you see a spot at the middle. But uh, what uh, uh, Tony did in the experiments, what he did, what he realized was that, uh, so this is just looking at the end product of the reaction, but what if you uh, attach the DNA to the surface and then flow in uh, the nuclear protein filaments and look at the interaction to see carry or not. And what he realized was that when the DNA was fully extended, extended on the surface, uh, you wouldn't see any pairing. But as soon as you would, uh, if you have a singly tethered DNA and you, uh, I, oh, I forgot to mention that you, before, for attaching the DNA to the surface, you use flow. So here, if you turn the flow off, and then that, and you put the flow on again, then you can start, you saw the spot at the middle of the DNA, which means the pairing happened. And he also tried uh, looking at the, a different kind of, uh, surface attachment is U-shaped uh, DNA where the end to end distance is smaller. And again, uh, turning off the flow and that, uh, putting it back on resulted in uh, uh, pairing. So basically this shows that the, the 3D conformation of the DNA is important for uh, the pairing reaction. So what he did, uh, he went on and uh, used the, the optical tweezers technique that I was telling you about. Uh, so use that technique to be able to uh, change the end-to-end -end distance of the uh, DNA. And we, uh, for this technique, we also use these uh, flow cells. And uh, this is a uh, magnified, this is a bigger uh, <coughs> picture of the flow cell. And it shows, uh, this is just the same buffer that we use for the experiment. Uh, uh, but uh, color, uh, color has been added just to show that uh, we're using laminar flow. So there are these uh, basically different uh, channels, which are, there's no physical barrier, but there, there's no mixing, as you can see. Uh, so in this special case, there's a reservoir here. So uh, I'll play a movie here so it will be more clear. Basically, what you do is that you have one channel, which are beads. You trap the beads with the IR laser. You trap two beads, and then you trap the uh, DNA and make these DNA dongles. And, and then you de-stain the DNA. The DNA is stable with the same dye that I mentioned before. So you de-stain it, and then uh, you bring the double into this reservoir where there is no flow, and uh, you have the nuclear protein filaments here. Uh, so basically, you want to have uh, control over end-to-end distance of DNA as well as uh, not having flow interfering with the reaction. Uh, so you dip it into the reservoir, and then take it back again and visualize it. And as you can see here in the movie, it shows the uh, different steps of the process. So you're in B channel, you trap leads, and then you move to the other the DNA channel, the trap the DNA, make the dongle, uh, and then moving to another, the next channel, which is the yes staining. <coughs> I forgot to mention 
here that he looked at the two different, uh, so there are two different regions, uh, homologous regions of the, uh, the target DNA, double strand DNA. One is the one that was in the middle of 430 base pair, uh, the single strand, uh, the homologous region is 300, uh, 430 base pair. The other, he also looked at longer homologous, uh, homo uh, homologous region, uh, 147 KB. And uh, again, uh, you will see the spot where it's supposed to be. And he, what he realized was that uh, changing the length of the film or the homologous region also changes the uh, efficiency of carrying it, as you can see, the motion is faster for uh, the 1.7 KB. So all together, these results uh, showed that uh, both the, the 3D conformation uh, of the DNA matter, but also the length of the temporary filaments, they, they both uh, have a role in uh, <coughs> the process, and that led to uh, uh, this uh, intersegmental contact sampling model uh, that uh, we think that the, the nuclear protein filament makes uh, uh, contact as all, so at the same time it makes contact with different regions of uh, the DNA, so having the DNA in a course for a random course for would, would increase the uh, <coughs> sampling rate basically and it would have a higher probability of finding the uh, homologous region. So what I have been trying to do is to see whether I would get the same uh, result for human rat 51, which is a homologous uh, uh, of, uh, which, which is from the same family as ready 8 but as uh, they are they are very similar uh, proteins, but there are dif uh, differences as well, which I don't uh, go into detail here. But uh, uh, so. What I did here basically, I repeated the same experiments, first looking at the end product of the bulk reaction. Again, mixing the banking piece of the protein ferments with human rat 51, mixing it with uh, uh, target DNA, and looking at the end product. And as you see, uh, I don't know if it's clear or not, there's a red spot in the middle of the. Yeah, it doesn't clear. <laughs> to take my work for this. Uh, so there's a red spot at the center of the DNA that shows the <laughs> And then, uh, so the thing is that, as I mentioned, uh, the disadvantage of uh, using turf is that uh, you have a lot of uh, stuff that's sticking at the surface as well. So this is just a movie showing that, uh, uh, just to make sure that the spot that you see is on the DNA and not at the surface, you basically the laser power and uh, photocrete the DNA and look for the spot to disappear and that's how we decide uh, whether it's a current product or not. And uh, this is just a histogram of the number of uh, this endpoint reaction and as you can see the spot appears where you're expected which is uh, at the middle of the <coughs> DNA. And the same thing, uh, repeating, I repeated the same thing for a longer uh, a longer nuclear uh, protein filament and a different spot, and again the same result. And, uh, <coughs> here's the spot here, but it's basically the same idea. Uh, so the other thing uh, was uh, basically the, was doing this, uh, the same, uh, using the same the dual optical trap to see if uh, I would get the same results as seeing the efficiency of the uh, pairing would uh, be affected by the entire distance of the DNA. And here it shows the uh, uh, DNA which uh, at this entire distance, uh, after uh, one minute of incubation, I wouldn't see any uh, pairing, whereas uh, when I decrease the entire distance, the spot appears in the same amount of uh, same incubation time as what appears. I apologize for the low quality of the images. Uh, we had some difficulties with the laser system. I think they started to work right before I uh, was leaving for the conference. So, uh, yeah, I was like, I don't have that much uh, data to show, but basically uh, just showing the same uh, thing. Uh, the only difference is that, oh, and I should mention that the, uh, for, 
So for almost 70% of the molecules that have been uh, looked at, uh, with the two mark, where the actual distance of the genes uh, are the DNA or the B2 bit distance in two micron, uh, I've seen for 70% of the cases I've seen very, which is very similar to uh, the, work, uh, the result of the case. Uh, the only difference that we have noticed so far is that I see a lot of, uh, okay, I don't know if you can see it or not, but uh, in this case, uh, there are multiple, I see a lot of uh, non specifically uh, attached to protein filaments, which are the histologically bound uh, filaments. Uh, in the case of uh, human rat 51, which kind of makes sense because we already know that uh, human rat 51 has a higher affinity for uh, DNA, so we think it could be that. But uh, again, in the work for Andre K, the same thing. Uh, I mean, the, there were these uh, heterologously bound filaments, but they were not as stable as what I see for uh, human gas one. So just to, yeah, so with, I, right, right now I'm just trying to get more data with the, the dual uh, optical tweezer technique and uh, try to quantify the uh, reaction for human rat 51 and see if it's uh, uh, it behaves exactly the same as we can or not and what are the differences. So the more challenging uh, part of the project would be to, uh, because in our genome, the DNA is not just native DNA, but the DNA is uh, wrapped around this nucleosome. So what the big question right now is that uh, how does the filament find homology when DNA is part of the nucleosome? And then it, it becomes more complicated because there are other factors, other things which are such as rat 4 here, which is a chromatic uh, remodeler and move basically into the nucleosomes. And, uh, so that, that would be a more challenging and more interesting aspect of the project which I'm hoping to be able to do. Uh, I'd just like to thank the people uh, in the uh, Fall Geoffrey's lab. And uh, this project was supposed to be in collaboration with David Benson's lab uh, in Paris, which uh, using a uh, magnetic tweezer technique to look at the same problem, which uh, due to a lot of uh, factors and difficulties, they haven't been able to do that, but we're still hoping that we could uh, continue the collaboration. And uh, thank you for your attention. Just um, you mentioned you have two ways, two technique to just do this experiment. For the first one, uh, you mentioned about the non-specific binding of the protein to the surface, for example. But what about DNA? How long is the DNA, and is it possible that when you have that uh, DNA, it also binds to the surface? Yeah, basically what we visualize is the DNA. The protein is not labeled here, so the brightest spot that we can see is the single strand DNA. So the single strand DNA is labeled and we make the, the protein filaments on labeled single strand DNA. So that is the DNA. So we can say that the nuclear protein filaments are into the, it could be the DNA or the protein. Okay. Do we have another question from Hansa? Uh, so it looks like this data would uh, support uh, a 3D search because and, and to add distance are close, when it's associated by two, is that what you think, or is there a 1D aspect of it, like sliding or anything like that? And second aspect, do you try this without the, without red 51 or? Without that? With, without the protein. I mean, just to make sure this is not That's a random like search. Yeah, no, I, have, I know of other works which uh, people have looked at just uh, binding. Uh, I haven't tried it actually. But um, in terms of sliding, uh, there is a work by TJ Hogg, recent work by TJ Hogg, that he, uh, they do single bond look for it and they, they record the sliding. But the length of the filaments uh, that they use is pretty short, I think about 40 bases or something. So they claim for a shorter uh, DNA, um, uh, strand, shorter filaments you would see uh, sliding. But the, the filaments that they're using, the, the largest as you saw, it's 400. But there's another work by A. Green, uh, he looks at that. They were looking 
they looked at the large developments and they didn't see a sliding. So I think uh, sliding could have one day sliding could happen or shorter. All right, let's think now let's try it again for a we heard uh, many things about dynamics of small particles, uh, such as um, uh, motion of uh, biological cells, uh, bacterial swimming, electrophoretic motion, Brownian motion, and uh, generally active matter. And most of the time, the dynamics have been staged in the isotropic environment, for example, in water. And um, there is uh, a lot of interest in uh, physics associated with dynamics of small particles in isotropic um, environment. And um, still, there are many things to learn, as we understood even from the presentations at this conference. But the question that uh, preoccupied us for the last um, few years was, uh, what would happen if, uh, I'm sorry, So the obvious question, as you probably figured out, is that uh, we thought that uh, it might be of interest to explore what would happen with the dynamics if instead of the isotropic environment, we will be dealing with uh, an environment that is uh, different when you move in this direction or in that direction, which is the elite crystal. So for us, it was the uh, field that was unexplored, and if you look at the dictionary uh, meaning of unexplored territory, this is from here. And uh, this is how this um, title appeared that uh, uh, was uh, inserted for us by Hunter. Uh, so I will be talking about dynamics of small particles uh, in uh, lake crystals. Uh, so first of all, I will uh, give you the basics of lake crystals uh, so that whenever you go to downtown uh, Kent uh, bars, you can start the uh, conversation with local very easily. <laughs> Second, uh, I will uh, just uh, explain how these basic things um, about physics of lake crystals translate into some 
counterintuitive effects such as levitation of uh, colloidal particles in brick crystal. And then I will proceed with the two examples of dynamics. Uh, first is um, lake crystal enabled electrophoresis, and the second would be the dynamics of so called living lake crystals. So, this is the basic uh, thing number one about uh, the lake crystals. Uh, you might have an organic crystal that has uh, long-range positional order and long-range orientational order. And then if you hit it, many of those organic crystals would show two stages melting. First, they would lose the positional ordering of the centers of mass of the molecules, and they will form, uh, in many cases, the simplest type of the crystal, the so-called pneumatic crystal shown here. The only type of ordering here is uh, long range ordering, is the orientational um, alignment of the long axis of the molecules. And then, if you increase the temperature further, you would um, uh, get the second melting, and uh, your material will be simply an isotopic fluid in which the molecules are free to rotate and not just to move around. Now, the uh, Medium is uh, orientationally ordered, and that means that practically any physical property is anisotropic. If you measure conductivity along the director, you will get one thing. If you measure it perpendicularly to the director, you will get a different number. The same for dielectric susceptibility and many other properties. Uh, the ground state of the pneumatic is the state in which the molecules are parallel to each other. So whenever you want to make a splay or any type of deformation in this orientation, you need to spend some energy. And because of that, you have the um, free energy of elastic distortions. And finally, lake crystals are always confined. You keep them typically in small bottles in the refrigerator. And so there is this anisotrope of interactions between the wall of the bottle or the cell and the liquid crystal that are uh, anisotropic. And uh, because this uh, um, interaction is uh, anisotropic, and not only in the bulk, but uh, also at the surfaces, you have an isotropy of the surface tension. Uh, that means that the director has some preferred direction uh, at the substrate. The phenomenon is called the surface anchor. So we can consider how these um, simple things translate into the combination of a colloidal particle and the liquid crystal. So the liquid crystal, let's just imagine that this is a uniform uh, aligned uh, cell and uh, we have a colloid that we place into the liquid crystal. So I show this little hair on the surface of the colloid that signifies that this particular colloid wants to see the director being perpendicular to its surface. So how do you reconcile this local tendency to form a kind of hedgehog with the generally uniform uh, far field in the director? So you have to somehow combine the two and uh, uh, the, the first solution, by the way, presented here, support, uh, suggested here by Sergey, Shainovsky was to, to create the Saturn ring uh, that uh, would uh, reconcile the uniformity in the far field and uh, satisfy the radial direction at the surface. If you think about this a little bit more, you might suggest that um, probably since you're creating this Saturn ring, and this Saturn ring has energy that is most probably proportional to the length, it might be beneficial, at least in some cases, uh, to shrink this ring into a point, and you can do it as shown on the, uh, at the bottom, uh, creating a point defect instead of the linear loop. And it turns out that um, in uh, thick cells or in infinite environment, this is an energetically stable solution that was uh, found by Lubensk and uh, his colleagues on the time. So you, you can take a microscope and verify that this prediction is in fact correct. But here you see a simple glass uh, sphere uh, submerged in the thick cell of a liquid crystal. And you might see that on the right hand side of the sphere, you have some uh, optical perturbation. And this is nothing else but uh, this uh, hedgehog. Now we have a microscope that allows us to trace the director distortions um, in the vertical cross-section of the cell. And when you use that microscope, you might see again that there is this perturbation associated with the point defect. 
But then there is also something strange. Uh, if you look at the scale bar, you will realize that the size of this sphere is about uh, 5 micrometers. And we know that the sphere is made of glass, and glass has a density that is much higher than the density of the liquid crystal. So for those of you who know the definition of colloids, this picture would appear kind of strange because the colloid does not sediment to the bottom. It kind of hangs up in the bulk, but while it should uh, go to the bottom. Sir, it's a vertical, is this? Yes, this is the vertical cross-section of the cell. So we are looking uh, along <laughs> the directionality of gravity. So the, the top green or dark uh, place is uh, glass, the bottom is glass. This is glass, the glass particle, and, uh, and uh, uh, the, the particle levity. So the effect is kind of very similar to some of those nice pictures <coughs> with levitation that we saw before uh, in the magnetic field, either uniform on the top or uh, gradient magnetic field levitating frog. Uh, at the bottom. So the, the principle of this levitation is very simple and it's ultimately related to the surface anchoring and the elasticity of the liquid crystal. So when you consider this vertical cross-section of the cell, there is of course gravity that pulls the particle down, but because the surface imposes normal boundary conditions and creates the gradients, whenever you are uh, moving the particle closer to, sub, to the substrate, the gradients of the director increase, and that means that the elastic energy increases. And the system doesn't want to increase the elastic energy, so whenever gravity and the elastic force balance each other, you would have a levitating z-coordinate of um, the particle that is uh, much larger than it would be in absence of the lake crystal. By the way, the simple model predicts that uh, the bigger the particle, the better it levitates. And this is experimental verification. On the right, you see slightly bigger particle, and it levitates at a higher C as compared to the smaller particle. So with this, uh, knowing that uh, we can easily keep the particles in the bulk of our cells, we decided to do our first experiments with uh, electrophoresis of um, colloids in the lake crystal environment. So I will remind you what is the electrophoretic uh, phenomenon in the case of uh, isotropic fluids. So uh, when you put something like a glass sphere in water, then what happens is that uh, the surface charges dissociate and uh, create electric double layer. And uh, when you apply electric field, this uh, electric field acts on the positive and negative parts of the electric double layer and creates kind of a torque. And uh, when you sum these torques over the surface of the sphere, you would realize that uh, if the sphere is fixed, then the electric field would cause the flow of electrolyte around this uh, fixed obstacle. If the sphere is free to move, then uh, it will move in the opposite direction and the fluid as a whole will stay stationary. Uh, it's easy to uh, calculate the expected velocity of electrophoresis. So the force that drives the charges is obviously proportional to the charge and the applied electric field. And the opposing force, the Stokes viscous drag, is uh, proportional to the velocity and the viscosity of the medium. Uh, so you would expect a linear dependency between the uh, velocity and the applied electric field. And so you start your experiment, and the good thing about the crystals is that you can always have the background, you know, verifying experiment um, by simply raising the temperature of the cell and uh, melting your lift crystal into the isotropic fluid. So with that, you know what is expected to happen with an isotropic uh, uh, electrolyte. And so this is the effect, um, as you see it, when the lake crystal is melted in, into its uh, isotropic phase. And you have the glass sphere, and you measure its velocity as the function of the applied electric field. So if the field is positive, then the particle moves into the opposite direction, uh, apparently because the charge is negative. If you change the polarity of the field, the polarity of the motion changes. And so it's a, a very nice uh, linear dependency precisely what you would expect from the simple analysis. The next thing you do is uh, you decrease the temperature, you cool the sample down, 
and uh, you introduce the pneumaticity, the pneumatic work. Uh, the, the, the cell is more or less uniform everywhere except for the locations of the particles where we have again this uh, perpendicular boundary conditions. And you start repeating the experiment again and you see that something rather strange. When the field is relatively small, you can say that the behavior is almost the same. But if you increase the field, then you see a very unexpected thing. Uh, for example, for one particular direction of the field, the particle stops and then suddenly starts to move in the opposite direction. Turns out that this directionality depends on um, the location of this point defect, whether it's on the right-hand side or left-hand side. And uh, if you have it on either of the two sides, turns out that uh, if you don't melt this pneumatic, it cannot jump from one pole to the other. Once it, create, it has been created on the right-hand side, it will always stay there. And so for uh, these two types of uh, h not locations, uh, you see the kind of mirror symmetry in the uh, behavior. And uh, at this stage, uh, we were really surprised. We didn't know what we saw, but we know that not knew that uh, the dependence by which you would describe such a behavior must contain a quadratic term in the applied electric field. So that immediately led to the conclusion that if it's so, then unlike in classic linear electrophoretic effect, we can drive our liquid crystal electrophoresis with an AC alternating current electric field. Because uh, the linear part will disappear, will go into zero, but the quadratic would always sustain itself. And, uh, and this is an example of the motion of the particles driven by the AC electric field that goes back and uh, force without um, changing the uh, amplitude. So uh, then we did the experiments also with spheres that uh, set tangential anchoring. And tangential anchoring is rather simple to imagine how it would behave in the surrounding the crystal. Uh, you expect it to, to, to form a kind of a quadrupolar, um, quadrupolar configuration. And then if you compare this one that is swimming and this one that is not swimming, as we found in the experiment, you realize that the mechanism should be somehow related to the symmetry of director distortions around the particles. And um, there is a nice, um, I'm trying to jump out of this, yeah. There is a nice um, painting in the MoMA Museum in New York City called uh, Blind Swimmer. Uh, what is interesting about this thing is that if you look closely, the very heart of this swimmer is asymmetric, it's of bipolar symmetry. The, the, the flow field around it is kind of uh, uh, quadrupolar, but uh, the artist realized that for the thing to swim, it must be of dipolar symmetry. So that, that was very interesting to, uh, to observe, but it didn't help us to understand uh, what is the mechanism in our case. So uh, let us for a moment uh, forget about uh, the particles and um, start looking at a kind of totally different system. But this is the system that would uh, help us to understand the mechanism very clearly. So I told you that uh, surface uh, interactions would set the particular orientation of the director. And um, uh, recently, Chico Wei at the Lake Crystal Institute uh, found a way to pattern this uh, uh, surface uh, director orientation mm -hmm. by using plasmonic uh, masks uh, with um, pre-pattern polarization field of the light and then he would use photosensitive substrate and the molecules there would adjust to the local polarization of the impingent light and then if we use this as the substrate for the liquid crystal cell then the director will look uh, like uh, it looks on the right hand side. So this is the pattern that was created by photo uh, alignment. And uh, this is not just a graphic illustration. This is a real uh, Polskov image of the electrical cell. So let's just consider uh, how ions that are always present in the crystals would behave in such a cell if we apply electric field. So the electric field goes from left to right. And I remind you that the crystal is an isotropic medium. And in this particular case, we are interested in the fact that um, 
uh, conductivity parallel to the director is uh, higher than the conductivity perpendicular to the director. So if I keep the electric field, then uh, the ion starts to move, uh, but uh, they uh, remember that it's much easier for them to move parallel to the director as opposed to the perpendicular direction. And whenever they move to the right hand side or left hand side, they also shift their Z position. It's like a train that goes through the rails. And uh, if I continue the process, look at how this all charges would move in the space, I would realize that uh, besides moving to the right and to the left, they also form separated uh, clouds, alternating clouds of positive and negative ions. Since I separated the charges, there is also a colonic force that would uh, move them as the whole and would drag the fluid with them. So in other words, by simply creating director distortions in this cell, I found a way to separate the charges in the applied electric field. And once the charges are separated and the electric field is still there, I expect some motion. And this motion is clearly seen in the following slide. So you see, this is, I will tell you a little bit, this might be a DC, it might be an AC, as uh, the uh, thing shows below. In a second I will explain why it doesn't matter. So what you see here is the lanes of um, uh, particles. Uh, those are fluorescent particles added to visualize the flow. So some of them move to the right, some to the left, but they form these nice um, lanes that um, uh, are not uh, intermixing with each other. And uh, this is the map of the velocities uh, for the particles. So um, Robin mentioned that that was kind of a DC picture, but in fact it was a an AC picture and it turns out that it doesn't matter which electric field AC or DC you're using. So here is, is an example when I reverse the polarity of the applied electric field. So on the left hand side the field was from left to right and uh, you saw how the charges would separate. On the right hand side the field is from right to left. And so now the positions of positive and negative charges are different, are opposite to what they've been before. But the force, which is a product of charge and the electric field, would remain the same. So this force, again, being the product of the charge and the electric field, whenever both of them change their sign, that would be fine because the product would be of the same sign. As a result, you expect that uh, your density created by the density of charges created by the electric field uh, being proportional to the electric field would create the force that does not that does not depend on the polarity of the field. And because of that, you also expect that the velocity of uh, the uh, electrophoretic or electroosmotic motion in this case would be polarity independent. And the next slide shows that uh, indeed, uh, whenever you measure the velocity and the function of the square of the field, you have a perfect linear dependency. Well, does that mean that the, the opposite charges are changing lanes by times? Exactly. They right. are. So they're just like back and forth by times. Right. Time. Go back and forth for uh, like peanuts, everything. But does it make any flow between the strikes? Even though the of charges course. are moving back and forth? Of course. So then, uh, of course, you, you can create uh, with this wonderful technique by uh, uh, Chico Wei, you can develop uh, any pattern. So he was interested in uh, Fresnel lenses, uh, that's the thing for the right hand side. But you realize immediately that if you are using this not as a Fresnel lens, but as a micro mixer, you would get a wonderful result too. Uh, here we just uh, use it as the patch to mix some. Uh, uh, fluorescent particles uh, in the little microfluidic pad and uh, the plot uh, on the right hand side shows how uh, dramatically more effective such a mixing is as compared to the mixing by diffusion which is uh, the only type of mixing you can achieve uh, at the micro scale without uh, additional pressure gradients or things like that. Uh, so you can also create um, topological defects through parity 
And then, if, for example, you create a pair of uh, destinations uh, shown here, uh, the flow will uh, be in the shape of two vortices. And uh, then, if you have uh, colloidal particles in the system that uh, are away from one of the destinations, these uh, two vortices will uh, accumulate uh, these particles at one of the nodes, at one of the destinations. And this is, by the way, for the uh, uh, fluid drop that, that uh, goes into the positive uh, core of the destination and uh, coalesces there with the rest of the fluid. So now coming back to the mechanism that we didn't understand at the beginning, uh, here is the example when instead of this photo patterning, we simply glue the colloidal particle to the substrate and then observe what would be the flow pattern around it. And what we see 